Sermon 78 of Leo the Great, Bishop of Rome. Translated by Charles Let Felto. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sermon 78. On the Whitsuntide Fast. 1. 1. Since the Apostles' day till now, self-restraint is the best defense against the devil's assaults. Today's festival, dearly beloved, hallowed by the descent of the Holy Ghost, is followed, as you know, by a solemn fast, which, being a salutary institution for the healing of soul and body, we must keep with devout observance. For when the apostles had been filled with the promised power, and the Spirit of Truth had entered their hearts, we doubt not that among the other mysteries of heavenly doctrine this discipline of spiritual self-restraint was first thought of at the prompting of the paraclete, in order that minds sanctified by fasting might be fitter for the chrism to be bestowed on them. The disciples of Christ had the protection of the Almighty aid, and the chiefs of the infant church were guarded by the whole Godhead of the Father and the Son through the presence of the Holy Ghost. Thus, against the threatened attacks of persecutors, against the terrifying shouts of the ungodly, they could not fight with bodily strength or pampered flesh, since that which delights the outer does most harm to the inner man. And the more one's fleshly substance is kept in subjection, the more purified is the reasoning of the soul. 2. The tempter is foiled in attacks upon those who have learnt these tactics. And so those teachers who have instructed all the church's sons by their examples and their traditions began the rudiments of the Christian warfare with holy fasts, that, having to fight against spiritual wickednesses, they might take the armor of abstinence, wherewith to slay the incentives to vice. For invisible foes and incorporeal enemies will have no strength against us if we be not entangled in any lusts of the flesh. The desire to hurt us is indeed ever active in the tempter, but he will be disarmed and powerless if he find no vantage ground within us from which to attack us. But who, encompassed with this frail flesh, and placed in this body of death, even one who has made much decided progress, can be so sure of his safety now as to believe himself free from the peril of all allurements? Although divine grace gives daily victory to his saints, yet he does not remove the occasion for fighting, because this very fact is part of our protector's mercy, who has always designed that something should remain for our ever-changing nature to win, lest it should boast itself on the ending of the battle. 3. And so this fast comes very opportunely after the Feast of Whitsuntide. Therefore, after the days of holy gladness, which we have devoted to the honor of the Lord rising from the dead and then ascending into heaven, and after receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, a fast is ordained as a wholesome and needful practice, so that, if perchance through neglect or disorder, even amid the joys of the festival, any undue license has broken out, it may be corrected by the remedy of strict abstinence, which must be the more scrupulously carried out, in order that what was on this day divinely bestowed on the church may abide in us. For being made the temple of the Holy Ghost, and watered with a greater supply than ever of the divine stream, we ought not to be conquered by any lusts, nor held in possession by any vices, in order that the habitation of divine power may be stained with no pollution. 4. And by proper use of it, we shall win God's favor. And this, assuredly, it is possible for all to obtain, God helping and guiding us, if, by the purification of fasting, and by merciful liberality, we take pains to be set free from the filth of sins, and to be rich in the fruits of love. For whatever is spent in feeding the poor, in healing the sick, in ransoming prisoners, or in any other deeds of piety, is not lessened, but increased. Nor will that ever be lost in the sight of God, which the loving kindness of the faithful has expended, seeing that whatever a man gives in relief, he lays up for his own reward. For blessed are the merciful, since God shall have mercy on them. Nor will shortcomings be remembered where the presence of true religion has been attested. On Wednesday and Friday, therefore, let us fast, 
and on Saturday let us keep vigil in the presence of the most blessed Apostle Peter, by whose prayers we surely trust to be set free both from spiritual foes and bodily enemies, through our Lord Jesus Christ, who with the Father and the Holy Ghost lives and reigns for ever and ever. Amen. End of Sermon 78Sermon 82 of Leo the Great, Bishop of Rome, translated by Charles Let Felto. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sermon 82 on the Feast of the Apostles Peter and Paul, June 29th. 1. Rome owes its high position to these apostles. The whole world, dearly beloved, does indeed take part in all holy anniversaries and loyalty to the one faith demands that whatever is recorded as done for all men's salvation should be everywhere celebrated with common rejoicings. But, besides that reverence which today's festival has gained from all the world, it is to be honored with special and peculiar exultation in our city, that there may be a predominance of gladness on the day of their martyrdom in the place where the chief of the apostles met their glorious end. For these are the men through whom the light of Christ's gospel shone on thee, O Rome, and through whom thou, who wast the teacher of error, wast made the disciple of truth. These are thy holy fathers and true shepherds who gave thee claims to be numbered among the heavenly kingdoms, and built thee under much better and happier auspices than they by whose zeal the first foundations of thy walls were laid, and of whom the one that gave thee thy name defiled thee with his brother's blood. These are they who promoted thee to such glory that being made a holy nation, a chosen people, a priestly and royal state, and the head of the world through the blessed Peter's holy see, thou didst attain a whiter sway by the worship of God than by earthly government. For although thou wert increased by many victories, and didst extend thy rule on land and sea, yet what thy toils in war subdued is less than what the peace of Christ has conquered. 2. The extension of the Roman Empire was part of the divine scheme. For the good, just, and almighty God, who has never withheld his mercy from mankind, and has ever instructed all men alike in the knowledge of himself by the most abundant benefits, has, by a more secret counsel and a deeper love, shown pity upon the wanderer's voluntary blindness and proclivities to evil, by sending his co-equal and co-eternal word, which, becoming flesh, so united the divine nature with the human, that he, by lowering his nature to the uttermost, has raised our nature to the highest. But that the result of this unspeakable grace might be spread abroad through the world, God's providence made ready the Roman Empire, whose growth has reached such limits that the whole multitude of nations are brought into close connection. For the divinely planned work particularly required that many kingdoms should be leagued together under one empire, so that the preaching of the world might quickly reach to all people when they were held beneath the rule of one state. And yet that state, in ignorance of the author of its aggrandizement, though it rule almost all nations, was enthralled by the errors of them all, and seemed to itself to have fostered religion greatly, because it rejected no falsehood. And hence, its emancipation through Christ was the more wondrous that it had been so fast bound by Satan. 3. On the dispersing of the twelve, St. Peter was sent to Rome. For when the twelve apostles, after receiving through the Holy Ghost the power of speaking with all tongues, had distributed the world into parts among themselves, and undertaken to instruct it in the gospel, the most blessed Peter, chief of the apostolic band, was appointed to the citadel of the Roman Empire, that the light of truth which was being displayed for the salvation of all the nations might spread itself more effectively throughout the body of the world from the head itself. What nation had not representatives then living in this city? Or what peoples did not know what Rome had learnt? Here it was that the tenets of philosophy must be crushed. Here that the follies of earthly wisdom must be dispelled. Here, that the cult of demons must be refuted. Here, that the blasphemy of all idolatries must be rooted out. 
here where the most persistent superstition had gathered together all the various errors which had anywhere been devised four st peter's love conquered his fears in coming to rome to this city then most blessed apostle peter thou didst not fear to come and when the apostle paul the partner of thy glory was still busied with regulating other churches didst enter this forest of roaring beasts this deep stormy ocean with greater boldness than when thou didst walk upon the sea and thou who hadst been frightened by the high priests made in the house of caiaphas hadst no fear of rome the mistress of the world was there any less power in claudius any less cruelty in nero than in the judgment of pilate or the jews savage rage so then it was the force of love that conquered the reasons for fear and thou didst not think those to be feared whom thou hadst undertaken to love but this feeling of fearless affection thou hadst even then surely conceived when the profession of thy love for the lord was confirmed by the mystery of the thrice repeated question and nothing else was demanded of this thy earnest purpose than that thou shouldest bestow the food wherewith thou hadst thyself been enriched on feeding his sheep whom thou didst love five saint peter was providentially prepared for his great mission thy confidence also was increased by many miraculous signs by many gifts of grace by many proofs of power thou hadst already taught the people who from the number of the circumcised had believed thou hadst already founded the church at antioch where first the dignity of the christian name arose thou hadst already instructed pontus galatia cappadocia asia and bithynia in the laws of the gospel message and without doubt as to the success of the work with full knowledge of the short span of thy life didst carry the trophy of christ's cross into the citadel of rome whither by the divine foreordaining there accompanied thee the honor of great power and the glory of much suffering six many noble martyrs have sprung from the blood of saints peter and paul thither came also thy blessed brother apostle paul the vessel of election and the special teacher of the gentiles and was associated with thee at a time when all innocence all modesty all freedom was in jeopardy under nero's rule whose fury inflamed by excess of all vices hurled him headlong into such a fiery furnace of madness that he was the first to assail the christian name with a general persecution as if god's grace could be quenched by the death of saints whose greatest gain it was to gain eternal happiness by contempt of this fleeting life precious therefore in the eyes of the lord is the death of his saints nor can any degree of cruelty destroy the religion which is founded on the mystery of christ's cross persecution does not diminish but increase the church and the lord's field is clothed with an ever richer crop while the grains which fall singly spring up and are multiplied a hundredfold hence how large a progeny have sprung from these two heaven-sown seeds is shown by the thousands of blessed martyrs who rivaling the apostles triumphs have traversed the city far and wide in purple clad and ruddy gleaming throngs and crowned it as it were with a single diadem of countless gems seven no distinction must be drawn between the merits of the two and over this band dearly beloved whom god has set forth for our example in patience and for our confirmation in the faith there must be rejoicing everywhere in the commemoration of all the saints but of these two fathers excellence we must rightly make our boast in louder joy for god's grace has raised them to so high a place among the members of the church that he has set them like the twin light of the eyes of the body whose head is christ about their merits and virtues which pass all power of speech we must not make distinctions because they were equal in their election alike in their toils undivided in their death but as we have proved for ourselves and our forefathers maintained we believe and are sure that amid all the toils of this life we must always be assisted in obtaining god's mercy by the prayers of special intercessors that we may be raised by the apostles merits in proportion as we are weighed down by our own sins through our lord jesus christ and so forth end of sermon 82 
Sermon 84 of Leo the Great, Bishop of Rome, translated by Charles Let Felto. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sermon 84 Concerning the Neglect of the Commemoration 1. The churchmen of Rome are in danger of forgetting past judgments and mercies, and becoming ungrateful to God. The fewness of those who were present has of itself shown, dearly beloved, that the religious devotion, wherewith, in commemoration of the day of our chastisement and release, the whole body of the faithful used to flock together in order to give God thanks, has on this last occasion been almost entirely neglected. And this has caused me much sadness of heart and great fear. For there is much danger of men becoming ungrateful to God, and through forgetfulness of his benefits not feeling sorrow for the chastisement, nor joy for the liberation. Accordingly, I fear, dearly beloved, lest that utterance of the prophet be addressed in rebuke to such men which says, Thou hast scourged them, and they have not grieved. Thou hast chastised them, and they have refused to receive correction. For what amendment is shown by them in whom such aversion to God's service is found? One is ashamed to say it, but one must not keep silence. More is spent upon demons than upon the apostles, and mad spectacles draw greater crowds than blessed martyrdoms. Who was it that restored this city to safety, that rescued it from captivity, the games of the circus-goers or the cares of the saints? Surely it was by the saints' prayers that the sentence of divine displeasure was diverted, so that we who deserved wrath were reserved for pardon. 2. Let them avail themselves betimes of God's long suffering and return to Him. I entreat you, beloved, let those words of the Saviour touch your hearts, who, when by the power of His mercy He had cleansed ten lepers, said that only one of them all had returned to give thanks, meaning without doubt that though the ungrateful ones had gained soundness of body, yet their failure in this godly duty arose from ungodliness of heart. And therefore, dearly beloved, that this brand of ingratitude may not be applied to you, return to the Lord, remembering the marvels which he has deigned to perform among us, and describing our release not, as the ungodly suppose, to the influences of the stars, but to the unspeakable mercy of Almighty God, who has deigned to soften the hearts of raging barbarians, Betake yourselves to the commemoration of so great a benefit with all the vigor of faith. Grave neglect must be atoned for by yet greater tokens of repentance. Let us use the mercy of him who has spared us to our own amendment, that the blessed Peter and all the saints, who have always been near us in many afflictions, may deign to aid our entreaties for you to the merciful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. End of Sermon 84Sermon 85 of Leo the Great, Bishop of Rome, translated by Charles Let Felto. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sermon 85 on the Feast of St. Lawrence the Martyr, August 10th. 1. The example of the martyr is most valuable. Whilst the height of all virtues, dearly beloved, and the fullness of all righteousness is born of that love wherewith God and one's neighbor is loved, Surely in none is this love found more conspicuous and brighter than in the blessed martyrs, who are as near to our Lord Jesus, who died for all men in the imitation of his love, as in the likeness of their suffering. For, although that love wherewith the Lord has redeemed us cannot be equaled by any man's kindness, because it is one thing that a man who is doomed to die one day should die for a righteous man, and another that one who is free from the debt of sin should lay down his life for the wicked. Yet the martyrs also have done great service to all men, in that the Lord, who gave them boldness, has used it to show that the penalty of death and the pain of the cross need not be terrible to any of his followers, but might be imitated by many of them. If, therefore, no good man is good for himself alone, and no wise man's wisdom befriends himself only, 
and the nature of true virtue is such that it leads many away from the dark error on which its light is shed. No model is more useful in teaching God's people than that of the martyrs. Eloquence may make intercession easy, reasoning may effectually persuade, but yet examples are stronger than words, and there is more teaching in practice than in precept. 2. The Saints' Martyrdom Described And how gloriously strong in this most excellent manner of doctrine the blessed martyr Laurentius is, by whose sufferings today is marked, even his persecutors were able to feel, when they found that his wondrous courage, born principally of love for Christ, not only did not yield itself, but also strengthened others by the example of his endurance. For when the fury of the Gentile potentates was raging against Christ's most chosen members, and attacked those especially who were of priestly rank, the wicked persecutor's wrath was vented on Laurentius the deacon, who was preeminent not only in the performance of the sacred rites, but also in the management of the church's property promising himself double spoil from one man's capture. For if he forced him to surrender the sacred treasures, he would also drive him out of the pale of true religion. And so this man, so greedy of money, and such a foe to the truth, arms himself with double weapon, with avarice to plunder the gold, with impiety to carry off Christ. He demands of the guileless guardian of the sanctuary that the church wealth on which his greedy mind was set would be brought to him. But the holy deacon showed him where he had them stored, by pointing to the many troops of poor saints, in the feeding and clothing of whom he had a store of riches which he could not lose, and which were the more entirely safe that the money had been spent on so holy a cause. 3. The description of his sufferings continued. The baffled plunderer therefore frets, and blazing out into hatred of a religion which had put riches to such a use, determines to pillage a still greater treasure by carrying off that sacred deposit wherewith he was enriched, as he could find no solid hoard of money in his possession. He orders Laurentius to renounce Christ, and prepares to ply the deacon's stout courage with frightful tortures. And, when the first elicit nothing, fiercer follow. His limbs, torn and mangled by many cutting blows, are commanded to be broiled upon the fire in an iron framework, which was of itself already hot enough to burn him, and on which his limbs were turned from time to time to make the torment fiercer and his death more lingering. 4. Laurentius has conquered his persecutor. Thou gainest nothing, thou prevailest nothing, O savage cruelty, his mortal frame is released from thy devices, and when Laurentius departs to heaven, thou art vanquished. The flame of Christ's love could not be overcome by thy flames, and the fire which burnt outside was less keen than that which blazed within. Thou didst but serve the martyr in thy rage, O persecutor. Thou didst but swell the reward in adding to the pain. For what did thy cunning devise, which did not redound to the conqueror's glory? when even the instruments of torture were counted as part of the triumph. Let us rejoice, then, dearly beloved, with spiritual joy, and make our boast over the happy end of this illustrious man in the Lord, who is wonderful in his saints, in whom he has given us a support and an example, and has so spread abroad his glory throughout the world, that from the rising of the sun to its going down, the brightness of his deacon's light doth shine, and Rome is become as famous in Laurentius as Jerusalem was ennobled by Stephen. By his prayer and intercession we trust at all times to be assisted, that, because all, as the Apostle says, who wish to live holily in Christ suffer persecution, we may be strengthened by the spirit of love, and be fortified to overcome all temptations by the perseverance of steadfast faith, through our Lord Jesus Christ, and so forth. End of Sermon 85。Sermon 88 of Leo the Great, Bishop of Rome, translated by Charles Let Felto. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sermon 88, on the fast of the seventh month, 3. 1. The fasts which the ancient prophets proclaimed are still necessary. 
Of what avail, dearly beloved, are religious fasts in winning the mercy of God and in renewing the fortunes of human frailty? We know from the statements of the holy prophets, who proclaim that justice of God, whose vengeance the people of Israel had again and again incurred through their iniquities, cannot be appeased save by fasting. Thus it is that the prophet Joel warns them, saying, Thus saith the Lord your God, Turn ye to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments, and turn ye to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and patient, and of great kindness and very merciful. And again, Sanctify a fast, proclaim a healing, assemble the people, sanctify the church. And this exhortation must in our days also be obeyed, because these healing remedies must of necessity be proclaimed by us too, in order that in the observance of the ancient sanctification, Christian devotion may gain what Jewish transgression lost. 2. Public services are of a higher character than private. But the respect that is paid to the divine decrees always brings a special blessing, whatever may be the extent of our voluntary services, so that publicly proclaimed celebrations are of a higher character than those which rest on private institution. For the exercise of self-restraint, which each individual imposes on himself at his own discretion, concerns the benefit of a certain portion only of the Church. But the fast which the whole Church undergoes leaves out no one from the general purification. And God's people then become strongest when the hearts of all the faithful meet together in one common act of holy obedience, when in the camp of the Christian army there is on all sides the same making ready for the fight and for defense. Though the cruel enemy rage in restless fury and spread all round his hidden snares, yet he will be able to catch no one and wound no one if he find no one off his guard, no one given up to sloth, no one inactive in works of piety. 3. The September fast calls us in this public way to self-amendment. To this unconquerable strength of unity, therefore, dearly beloved, we are even now invited by the solemn fast of the seventh month, that we may lift our souls to the Lord, free from worldly cares and earthly concerns. And because... Always needful as this endeavor is, we cannot all adhere to it perpetually, and often through human frailty we fall back from higher things to the things of earth. Let us at least on these days, which are most healthfully ordained for our correction, withdraw ourselves from worldly occupations and steal a little time for promoting our eternal welfare. For in many ways, as it is written, we all stumble. And though by the daily gift of God we be cleansed from diverse pollutions, yet there cling to unweary souls for the most part darker stains, which need a greater care to wash them out, a stronger effort to destroy them. And the fullest abolition of sins is obtained when the whole church offers up one prayer and one confession. For if the Lord has promised fulfillment of all they shall ask to the holy and devout agreement of two or three, what shall be denied to many thousands of the people who unite in one act of worship and with one breath make their common supplications? 4. Community of goods and of actions is most precious in God's sight. It is a great and very precious thing, beloved, in the Lord's sight, when Christ's whole people engage together in the same duties and all ranks and degrees of either sex cooperate with the same intent when one purpose animates all alike of declining from evil and doing good, when God is glorified in the works of his slaves, and the author of all godliness is blessed in unstinted giving of thanks. The hungry are nourished, the naked are clothed, the sick are visited, and men seek not their own, but that which is another's, so long as, in relieving the misery of others, each one makes the most of his own means. And it is easy to find a cheerful giver where a man's performances are only limited by the extent of his power. By this grace of God, which worketh all in all, the benefits and the deserts of the faithful are both enjoyed in common. For they whose income is not alike can yet think alike. And when one rejoices over another's bounty, his feelings put him on the same level with him whose powers of spending are on a different level. 
In such a community there is no disorder nor diversity, for all the members of the whole body agree in one strong purpose of godliness, and he who glories in the wealth of others is not put to shame at his own poverty. For the excellence of each portion is the glory of the whole body. And when we are all led by God's Spirit, not only are the things we do ourselves our own, but those of others also, over the doing of which we rejoice. 5. Let us then make the best use possible of the opportunity. Let us then, dearly beloved, lay hold upon this most sacred unity in all its blessed integrity, and engage in the solemn fast with the concordant purpose of a good will. Nothing hard, nothing harsh is asked of any one, nor is anything imposed beyond our strength whether in the discipline of abstinence or in the amount of alms. Each knows what he can and what he cannot do. Let every one pay his quota, assessing himself at a just and reasonable rate, that the sacrifice of mercy be not offered sadly nor reckoned among losses. Let so much be expended on pious work as will justify the heart, wash the conscience, and in a word profit both giver and receiver. Happy indeed is that soul, and truly to be admired, which, in its love of doing good, fears not the failing of the means, and has no distrust that he will give him money still to spend, from whom he had what he spent in the past. But because few possess this greatness of heart, and yet it is truly a pious thing for each one not to forsake the care of his own, we, without prejudice to the more perfect sort, lay down for you this general rule, and exhort you to perform God's bidding according to the measure of your ability. For cheerfulness becomes the benevolent man, who should so manage his liberality, that, while the poor rejoice over the help supplied, home needs may not suffer. And he that ministers seed to the sower, shall both provide bread to the eater, and multiply your seed, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. On Wednesday and Friday, therefore, let us fast, and on Saturday keep vigil all together in the presence of the most blessed Apostle Peter, by whose merits and prayers we are sure God's mercy will be vouchsafed to us in all things, through our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns for ever and ever. Amen. End of Sermon 88「Sermon 90 of Leo the Great, Bishop of Rome, translated by Charles Letfelto. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sermon 90, on the fast of the seventh month, 5. 1. We must always be seeking pardon, because we are always liable to sin. We proclaim the holy fast of the seventh month, dearly beloved, for the exercise of common devotions confidently inciting you with fatherly exhortations to make Christian by your observance that which was formerly Jewish. For it is at all times suitable, and in agreement with both the New and Old Testament, that the divine mercy should be sought with chastisement both of mind and body, because nothing is more effectual in prevailing with God than that a man should judge himself and never cease from asking pardon, knowing that he is never without fault. For human nature has this flaw in itself, not planted there by the Creator, but contracted by the transgressor, and transmitted to his posterity by the law of generation, so that from the corruptible body springs that which may corrupt the soul also. Hence, although the inner man be now reborn in Christ and rescued from the bonds of captivity, it has unceasing conflicts with the flesh, and has to endure resistance in seeking to restrain vain desires. And in this strife such perfect victory is not easily obtained, that even those habits which must be broken off do not still encumber us, and those vices which must be slain do not wound. However wisely and prudently the mind presides as judge over the outer senses, yet even amid the pains it takes to rule, and the limits it imposes on the appetites of the flesh, the temptation is always too close at hand. For whoso abstracts himself from pleasure or pain of body, that his mind is not affected by that which delights or racks it from without. Joy and sorrow are inseparable from a man. No part of him is free from the kindlings of wrath, the overpowerings of delight, the castings down of affliction. 
and what turning away from sin can there be where ruler and ruled alike are liable to the same passions? Rightly does the Lord exclaim that the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. 2. Christ is himself the way which he bids us tread. And lest we should be led by despair into sheer inaction, he promises that the divine power shall make those things possible which are to man impossible from his own lack of power. For narrow and straight is the way that leadeth unto life, and no one could set foot on it, no one could advance one step, unless Christ, by making himself the way, unbarred the difficulties of approach. And thus the ordainer of the journey becomes the means whereby we are able to accomplish it, because not only does he impose the labor, but also brings us to the heaven of rest. In him, therefore, we find our model of patience, in whom we have our hope of life eternal. For if we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. Since, as the Apostle says, he that saith he abideth in Christ ought himself also to walk as he walked. Otherwise we make a vain pretense and show, if we follow not his steps whose name we glory in, and assuredly they would not be irksome to us, but would free us from all dangers, if we love nothing but what he commanded us to love. 3. The love of God contrasted with the love of the world. For there are two loves from which proceed all wishes, as different in quality as they are different in their sources. For the reasonable soul which cannot exist without love is the lover either of God or of the world. In the love of God there is no excess, but in the love of the world all is hurtful. And therefore we must cling inseparably to eternal treasures, but things temporal we must use like passers-by that as we are sojourners hastening to return to our own land, all the good things of this world which meet us may be as aids on the way, not snares to detain us. Therefore the blessed Apostle makes this proclamation. The time is short. It remains that those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who weep as though they wept not, and those who rejoice as though they rejoiced not, and those who buy as though they possessed not, and those that use this world as though they used it not. For the fashion of this world passes away. But as the world attracts us with its appearance and abundance and variety, it is not easy to turn away from it, unless in the beauty of things visible the Creator rather than the creature is loved. For when he says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God from all thy heart, and from all thy mind, and from all thy strength, he wishes us in nothing to loosen ourselves from the bonds of his love. And when he links the love of our neighbor also to this command, he enjoins on us the imitation of his own goodness, that we should love what he loves, and do what he does. For although we be God's husbandry and God's building, and neither is he that planteth anything, nor he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase, Yet in all things he requires our ministry and service, and wishes us to be the stewards of his gifts, so that he who bears God's image may do God's will. For this reason, in the Lord's Prayer we say most devoutly, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so also on earth. For what else do we ask for in these words, but that God may subdue those whom he has not yet subdued, and as in heaven he makes the angels ministers of his will, so also on earth he may make men. And in seeking this we love God, we love also our neighbor. And the love within us has but one object, since we desire the bondservant to serve, and the Lord to have rule. 4. The love of God is fostered by good works. This state of mind, therefore, beloved, from which earthly love is excluded, is strengthened by the habit of well-doing because the conscience must needs be delighted at good deeds, and do willingly what it rejoices to have done. Thus it is that fasts are kept, alms freely given, justice maintained, frequent prayer resorted to, and the desires of individuals become the common wish of all. Labor fosters patience, gentleness extinguishes anger, loving kindness treads down hatred, Unclean desires are slain by holy aspirations. Avarice is cast out by liberality. And burdensome wealth becomes the means of virtuous acts. But because the snares of the devil, 
are not at rest even in such a state of things. Most rightly, at certain seasons of the year, the renewal of our vigor is provided for. And now in particular, when one who is greedy of present good might boast himself over the clemency of the weather and the fertility of the land, and having stored his crops in great barns, might say to his soul, Thou hast much goods, eat and drink. Let him take heed to the rebuke of the divine voice, and hear it saying, Thou fool, this night they require thy soul of thee, and the things which thou hast prepared, whose shall they be? This should be the wise man's most anxious consideration, in order that, as the days of this life are short and its span uncertain, death may never come upon him unawares, and that, knowing himself mortal, he may meet his end fully prepared. And so, that this may avail both for the sanctification of our bodies and the renewal of our souls, on Wednesday and Friday let us fast, and on Saturday let us keep vigil with the most blessed Apostle Peter, whose prayers will help us to obtain fulfillment of our holy desires through Christ our Lord, who, with the Father and the Holy Ghost, lives and reigns for ever and ever. Amen. End of Sermon 90「Sermon 91 of Leo the Great, Bishop of Rome, translated by Charles Let Felto. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sermon 91 on the Fast of the Seventh Month, 6. 1. Abstinence must include discipline of the soul as well as of the body. There is nothing, dearly beloved, in which the divine providence does not assist the devotions of the faithful. For the very elements of the world also minister to the exercise of mind and body in holiness, seeing that the distinctly varied revolution of days and months opens for us the different pages of the commands, and thus the seasons also, in some sense, speak to us of that which the sacred institutions enjoin. And hence, since the year's course has brought back the seventh month to us, I feel certain that your minds are spiritually aroused to keep the solemn fast since you have learnt by experience how well this preparation purifies both the outer and the inner parts of men, so that by abstaining from the lawful, resistance becomes easier to the unlawful. But do not limit your plan of abstinence, dearly beloved, to the mortifying of the body, or to the lessening of food alone. For the greater advantages of this virtue belong to the chastity of the soul, which not only crushes the lusts of the flesh, but also despises the vanities of worldly wisdom. As the Apostle says, Take heed that no one deceive you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men. 2. And in particular, we must abstain from heresy, and that of Eutyches, as well as that of Nestorius. We must restrain ourselves, therefore, from food, but much more must we fast from errors, that the mind given up to no carnal pleasure may be taken captive by no falsehood. Because as in past days, so also in our own, there are not wanting enemies of the truth, who dare to stir up civil wars within the Catholic Church, in order that by leading the ignorant into agreement with their ungodly doctrines, they may boast of increase in numbers through those whom they have been able to sever from the body of Christ. For what is so opposed to the prophets, so repugnant to the Gospels, so at variance with the Apostles' teaching, as to preach one single nature in the Lord Jesus Christ, born of Mary, and without respect to time, co-eternal with the Eternal Father? If it is only man's nature which is to be acknowledged, which is the Godhead which saves? If only God's, where is the humanity which is saved? But the Catholic faith, which withstands all errors, refutes these blasphemies, also at the same time condemning Nestorius, who divides the divine from the human, and denouncing Eutyches, who nullifies the human in the divine. Seeing that the Son of true God, himself true God, possessing unity and equality with the Father and with the Holy Ghost, has vouchsafed likewise to be true man, and after the Virgin Mother's conception was not separated from her flesh and childbearing, so uniting humanity to himself as to remain immutably God, so imparting Godhead to man as not to destroy, but enhance him by glorification. For he who became the form of a slave ceased not to be the form of God. 
and he is not one joined with the other, but one in both, so that ever since the word became flesh, our faith is disturbed by no vicissitudes of circumstance. But whether in the miracles of power or in the degradation of suffering, we believe him to be God who is man, and man who is God. 3. The truth of the Incarnation is proved both by the Eucharistic feast and by the divine institution of almsgiving. Dearly beloved, utter this confession with all your heart and reject the wicked lies of heretics, that your fasting and almsgiving may not be polluted by any contagion with error. For then is our offering of the sacrifice clean, and our gifts of mercy holy. Then those who perform them understand that which they do. For when the Lord says, Unless ye have eaten the flesh of the Son of Man and drunk his blood, ye will not have life in you, you ought so to be partakers of the heavenly table, as to have no doubt whatever concerning the reality of Christ's body and blood. For that is taken in the mouth which is believed in faith. And it is vain for them to respond, Amen, who dispute that which is taken. But when the prophet says, Blessed is he who considereth the poor and needy, he is the praiseworthy distributor of clothes and food among the poor, who knows he is clothing and feeding Christ in the poor. For he himself says, As long as ye have done it to one of my brethren, ye have done it to me. And so Christ is one, true God and true man, rich in what is his own, poor in what is ours, receiving gifts and distributing gifts, partner with mortals and the quickener of the dead so that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, of things on earth, and of things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that the Lord Jesus Christ is in the glory of God the Father, living and reigning with the Holy Spirit for ever and ever. Amen. End of Sermon 91Sermon 95 of Leo the Great, Bishop of Rome Translated by Charles Leck Pelto. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sermon 95. A Homily on the Beatitudes. St. Matthew 5, 1 through 9. 1. Introduction of the Subject. When our Lord Jesus Christ, beloved, was preaching the gospel of the kingdom and was healing diverse sicknesses through the whole of Galilee, the fame of his mighty works had spread into all Syria. Large crowds, too, from all parts of Judea were flocking to the heavenly physician. For as human ignorance is slow in believing what it does not see, and in hoping for what it does not know, those who were to be instructed in the divine lore needed to be aroused by bodily benefits and visible miracles, so that they might have no doubt as to the wholesomeness of his teaching when they actually experienced his benignant power. And therefore, that the Lord might use outward healings as an introduction to inward remedies, and after healing bodies might work cures in the soul, he separated himself from the surrounding crowd, ascended into the retirement of a neighboring mountain, and called his apostles to him there, that from the height of that mystic seat he might instruct them in the loftier doctrines, signifying from the very nature of the place and act that he it was who had once honored Moses by speaking to him, then indeed with a more terrifying justice, but now with a holier mercifulness, that what had been promised might be fulfilled when the prophet Jeremiah says, Behold, the days come when I will complete a new covenant for the house of Israel and for the house of Judah. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds, and in their heart will I write them. He therefore who had spoken to Moses, spoke also to the apostles. And the swift hand of the word wrote and deposited the secrets of the new covenant in the disciples' hearts. There were no thick clouds surrounding him as of old, nor were the people frightened off from approaching the mountain by frightful sounds and lightning. But quietly and freely his discourse reached the ears of those who stood by, that the harshness of the law might give way before the gentleness of grace and the spirit of adoption might dispel the terrors of bondage. 2. The blessedness of humility discussed. The nature, then, of Christ's teaching is attested by his own holy statements, that they who wish to arrive at eternal blessedness may understand the steps of ascent to that high happiness. 
Blessed, he saith, are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It would perhaps be doubtful what poor he was speaking of, if in saying, Blessed are the poor, he had added nothing which would explain the sort of poor, and then that poverty itself would appear sufficient to win the kingdom of heaven, which many suffer from hard and heavy necessity. But when he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, he shows that the kingdom of heaven must be assigned to those who are recommended by the humility of their spirits, rather than by the smallness of their means. Yet it cannot be doubted that this possession of humility is more easily acquired by the poor than the rich, for submissiveness is the companion of those that want, while loftiness of mind dwells with riches. Notwithstanding, even in many of the rich is found that spirit which uses its abundance not for the increasing of its pride, but on works of kindness, and counts that for the greatest gain which it expends on the relief of others' hardships. It is given to every kind and rank of men to share in this virtue, because men may be equal in will, though unequal in fortune. And it does not matter how different they are in earthly means, who are found equal in spiritual possessions. Blessed, therefore, is poverty which is not possessed with a love of temporal things, and does not seek to be increased with the riches of the world, but is eager to amass heavenly possessions. 3. Scriptural Examples of Humility Of this high-souled humility the apostles first, after the Lord, have given us example, who, leaving all that they had without difference at the voice of the heavenly Master, were turned by a ready change from the catching of fish to be fishers of men, and made many like themselves through the imitation of their faith. When with those first begotten sons of the church, the heart of all was one, and the spirit one, of those that believed. For they, putting away the whole of their things and possessions, enriched themselves with eternal goods through the most devoted poverty, and, in accordance with the apostles' preaching, rejoiced to have nothing of the world, and possessed all things with Christ. Hence the blessed apostle Peter, when he was going up into the temple, and was asked for alms by the lame man, said, Silver and gold is not mine, but what I have I give thee, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Arise and walk. What more sublime than this humility? What richer than this poverty? He hath not stores of money, but he hath gifts of nature. He whom his mother had brought forth lame from the womb is made whole by Peter with a word. And he who gave not Caesar's image in a coin restored Christ's image on the man. And by the riches of this treasure not he only was aided whose power of walking was restored, but five thousand men also, who then believed at the apostles' exhortation on account of the wonder of this cure. And that poor man who had not what to give to the asker bestowed so great a bounty of divine grace that as he had set one man straight on his feet, so he healed these many thousands of believers in their hearts and made them leap as an heart in Christ, whom he had found limping in Jewish unbelief. 4. The blessedness of mourning discussed. After the assertion of this most happy humility, the Lord hath added, saying, Blessed are they which mourn, for they shall be comforted. This mourning, beloved, to which eternal comforting is promised, is not the same as the affliction of this world. Nor do those laments which are poured out in the sorrowings of the whole human race make any one blessed. The reason for holy groanings, the cause of blessed tears, is very different. Religious grief mourns sin, either that of others or one's own. Nor does it mourn for that which is wrought by God's justice, but it laments over that which is committed by man's iniquity, where he that does wrong is more to be deplored than he who suffers it. Because the unjust man's wrongdoing plunges him into punishment, but the just man's endurance leads him on to glory. 5. The Blessedness of the Meek Next, the Lord says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall possess the earth by inheritance. To the meek and gentle, to the humble and modest, and to those who are prepared to endure all injuries, the earth is promised for their possession. And this is not to be reckoned a small or cheap inheritance, as if it were distinct from our earthly dwelling, since it is no other than these who are understood to enter the kingdom of heaven. The earth, then, which is promised to the meek, 
and is to be given to the gentle in possession, is the flesh of the saints, which in reward for their humility will be changed in a happy resurrection, and clothed with the glory of immortality, in nothing now to act contrary to the spirit, and to be in complete unity and agreement with the will of the soul. For then the outer man will be the peaceful and unblemished possession of the inner man. Then the mind, engrossed in beholding God, will be hampered by no obstacles of human weakness, nor will it any more have to be said, The body which is corrupted weigheth upon the soul, and its earthly house presseth down the sense which thinketh many things. For the earth will not struggle against its tenant, and will not venture on any insubordination against the rule of its governor. For the meek shall possess it in perpetual peace, and nothing shall be taken from their rights, when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, that their danger may turn into reward, and what was a burden become an honor. 6. The Blessedness of Desiring Righteousness After this the Lord goes on to say, Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. It is nothing bodily, nothing earthly, that this hunger, this thirst, seeks for, but it desires to be satiated with the good food of righteousness, and wants to be admitted to all the deepest mysteries, and be filled with the Lord himself. Happy the mind that craves this food and is eager for such drink, which it certainly would not seek for if it had never tasted of its sweetness. But hearing the prophet's spirit saying to him, Taste and see that the Lord is sweet, it has received some portion of sweetness from on high, and blazed out into love of the purest pleasure, so that spurning all things temporal, it is seized with the utmost eagerness for eating and drinking righteousness, and grasps the truth of that first commandment which says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God out of all thy heart, and out of all thy mind, and out of all thy strength, since to love God is nothing else but to love righteousness. In fine, as in that passage the care for one's neighbor is joined to the love of God, so too here the virtue of mercy is linked to the desire for righteousness. And it is said, 7. The Blessedness of the Merciful Blessed are the merciful, for God shall have mercy on them. Recognize, Christian, the worth of thy wisdom, and understand to what rewards thou art called, and by what methods of discipline thou must attain thereto. Mercy wishes thee to be merciful, righteousness to be righteous, that the Creator may be seen in his creature, and the image of God may be reflected in the mirror of the human heart, expressed by the lines of imitation. The faith of those who do good is free from anxiety. Thou shalt have all thy desires, and shalt obtain without end what thou lovest. And since, through thine almsgiving, all things are pure to thee, to that blessedness also thou shalt attain which is promised in consequence, where the Lord says, 8. The Blessedness of the Pure Heart Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Great is the happiness, beloved, of him for whom so great a reward is prepared. What, then, is it to have the pure heart, but to strive after those virtues which are mentioned above? And how great the blessedness of seeing God! What mind can conceive? What tongue declare? And yet this shall ensue when man's nature is transformed, so that no longer in a mirror nor in a riddle, but face to face it sees the very Godhead as he is, which no man could see and through the unspeakable joy of eternal contemplation, obtains that which eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man. Rightly is this blessedness promised to purity of heart, for the brightness of the true light will not be able to be seen by the unclean sight, and that which will be happiness to minds that are bright and clean will be a punishment to those that are stained. Therefore, let the mists of earth's vanities be shunned, and your inward eyes purged from all the filth of wickedness, that the sight may be free to feed on this great manifestation of God, for to the attainment of this we understand what follows to lead. 9. The Blessedness of Peacemaking Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. This blessedness, beloved, belongs not to any and every kind of agreement and harmony, 
but to that of which the apostle speaks, have peace towards God, and of which the prophet David speaks, much peace have they that love thy law, and they have no cause of offense. This peace, even the closest ties of friendship and the exactest likeness of mind do not really gain if they do not agree with God's will. Similarity of bad desires, leagues in crimes, associations of vice, cannot merit this peace. The love of the world does not consort with the love of God, nor doth he enter the alliance of the sons of God who will not separate himself from the children of this generation. Whereas they who are in mind always with God, giving diligence to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, never dissent from the eternal law, uttering that prayer of faith, Thy will be done as in heaven so on earth. These are the peacemakers. These are thoroughly of one mind and fully harmonious, and are to be called sons of God and joint heirs with Christ, because this shall be the record of the love of God and the love of our neighbor that we shall suffer no calamities, be in fear of no offense, but all the strife of trial ended rest in God's most perfect peace, through our Lord, who with the Father and the Holy Spirit liveth and reigneth for ever and ever. Amen. End of Sermon 95 End of the Sermons of Leo the Great, Bishop of Rome Translated by Charles Let Felto Recording by Jonathan Lang